Maybe we fire up complex cases and we look outside the box. Because in these circumstances, the complex cases, what you're really trying to do is take a vertebral compression fracture that is in a very unfavorable landscape and still succeed with restoring the integrity of the spine and the biomechanical strength of the spine without compromising its neurologic protection. So vertebral plana, as you might imagine, if your start point is off, your end point is off in either direction. So it's really important that you have that orthogonal AP that allows you to uh, align your trajectory with the difficult thing you're trying to enter. Notice that the vertebral plana is the same dimension as your jam sheeting. So precision here is critically important, and precision bilaterally is critically important. Uh, here again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm uh, sure. Did that work? That worked. So this year, at one point in time, it used to be a relative classification. It's not anymore. In fact, there's an article, Neil just wrote an article three years ago that published a series of these and got really optimal outcomes. So what, what you're seeing right there is the center of the cube body. That can be even more compressed than that if you still are. And if you look on the lateral side of these, the scroll of the sagittal entrance out to the lateral portion, the lateral portion will be higher. It won't be nearly as compressed. The most compressed portion will be in the center. So these are, are done, and it's best done bilaterally. It's best done with the pedicles lying directly up with what you can see the triangular portion and the remaining portions of the cubic on both sides that have a trajectory like this. And you can tell this case is done by somebody that knows what they're doing because you line the pedicles up with the remainder of the cubic body. So technically, what I do with this is I do things that orthopedic surgeons do. So whether you're talking about a wrist, a femur, a knee, a spine, you uh, approach it anatomically. You perform a reduction maneuver. So if the fracture was caused by collapse, I place uh, bolsters. I do these on Jackson tables, which are uh, fluoroscopic tables that have a breast bolster and pelvic bolster, and you can alter the position of the hips so that you can hyperextend them, which automatically reduces thoracolumbar fractures. But then when I, I put my finger on the spinous process while placing the balloon, after I have curetted, so I curette bilaterally, from lateral to medial, from both sides. So the center of the vertebral body is uh, separated so that this cleft goes from here to here. This end plate is independent and free of this end plate so that when I push down on the spinous process, it wants to open. And with the balloons in place, I inflate balloons as I reduce the fracture. Just like if you've got a crooked wrist, you reduce the fracture, and then the cement and balloons hold it in place. And restoration of vertebral height can be accomplished in what looks like a completely collapsed bone. So reduction, preparation, curatage, 
sequential inflation while you reduce and position the body in hyperextension so there's no weight across the front of the spine. And the fracture will give back the height loss that it's suffered. Doug, uh, what, what tricks of the trade do you have to share on vertebral plana? So I always go bilaterally. I always try to reduce. It doesn't matter how old the fracture is. It matters if it's present and things like the class. You know, I think you know everything there is to know about the fracture. I'd recommend an article by Weissach. And it's the blow your hair back article. Some fractures are vertebral plana that are easily re reducible. Other ones are chronic. And the thing about uh, complaint, one of the things that you also need to know is meniscus. Sometimes grandma calls me standing high and has a vertebral plane over a couple weeks. What does that tell you? It tells you that bone mineral density is bad. This is Janan's other article, which is really good. It basically, degree of osteoporosis and the degree of fracture, the magnitude of the fracture are directly related. So, more the compression, worse the osteoporosis. So, I, I would encourage you to loosen up these other vertebral planes. Please, in my experience, Having a flat approach that would be soft, and then have it lined up with the rest of the people body or the APB going bilaterally, trying to reduce it if you can, provide tremendous benefit if somebody's had persistent pain from a fracture. And in regard to treating all of these, there's one of the things, the point I was trying to make is cognitive distance. It hurts, and you can relate the pain to the presence of the fracture. Treat it. If it hurts, treat it. If it doesn't hurt, don't treat it. Well, Doug also um, uh, passed over uh, talking about uh, qualities of population health metrics, how you measure across populations, things that work well there. Another way to look at that very same thing is to use cost metrics, so this is what regulators look at. And this, this graph is of two little old ladies who have vertebral compression fractures who enter the same emergency room in a community that is within 30 miles of us right now. And this is what happens if that lady goes to cement augmentation at the initial encounter. In each of these subsequent encounters for the woman who does not go to augmentation until here, each of these subsequent encounters can be tracked in the medical record. And they can be tracked for whether they're opioid related adverse events associated with a conservative treatment. They can be tracked whether they are slip and falls subsequent to painful give way of the extremities. And now they're in for wrist fracture or hip fracture. And they can be tracked for uh, back to the emergency room for the fourth time for urinary retention and sent to a nursing home where they ultimately dwindle before being going back to the emergency room and getting treated. And each of these has a series of costs that can be tracked to the uh, date of the next encounter, whether the encounter is the clinic or the encounter is the ER or the encounter is the SNF. And what you can see is there are comparable, not equivalent, but they are comparable changes in pain and function scales. So the pain scale will be numerically a one scale. The function scale will be a little more. Something that's very easy for an elderly woman to fill out. That's SF36 diagram. Sexual function in an 85 year old female is probably not your business. So you might not want to be going there. But Roland Morris, yeah, it'll give you a really good uh, look at. And the cost differential here, it's huge. So when purchasers uh, and payors are looking at profoundly beneficial outcomes associated with treatments that are promptly acquired and delays that are avoided, 
in 700,000 fractures per year, those numbers are massively expensive numbers. And the quality of life change can be obtained later, but this is all misery. This is all misery, pain, and complication. There are also um, life years survival uh, statistics that are different for these two groups. So the non-surgical management folks are more accurately reflected in this population because you're concretely looking at them. The non true non-surgical management folks, you cannot see because they disappear back into homes and families and are not tracked. But this line keeps going. And the cost associated with it and the shortening lifespan keeps going. So when you're looking at what impact this has on a community, the CEO of the hospital wants this as a pathway in his emergency room. Because this is a CT scan, this is a repeat MRI, this is a repeat MRI, and these are other visits to the emergency room for pain management issues. And the costs of each of those are avoided in this scenario. So I temporarily diverged because you covered so much today. So now we're going to go back to basics of getting AP lateral x-rays. And I'm going to show you what this patient looks like. But you can see the hint of it here. You, you can see you are orthogonal here, but you are tilted. So this is a scoliosis case. You can see that everything has gone out of plane up here. So this is a deformity case. And in looking at the lateral, you're lined up here, but you're out of plane very rapidly. So you know that if you line up the fracture to be treated orthogonally, you'll be able to succeed without the distortions of anatomy that go on above and below. And so there it is uh, placed and Okay, uh, before I get to the deformity, because I'll just show you what the post-op uh, looks like when I see you back in the office. Uh, the other uh, area where complexity occurs is erosive, destructive, lytic lesions of the spine. And in some circumstances, you can completely lose the pedicle and only have a single anatomical approach that you have confidence in. In those circumstances, Doug, do you uh, line up and assume where the pedicle is, or do you go contralateral and remain unipedicular? The right answer is go contralateral, remain unipedicular, but you can guess, and I do that all the time. That's one of those, don't do it until you really are comfortable with it, because there's no anatomy. But, you know, God loves symmetry, right? What's on the right is going to be on the left, and if you can extrapolate uh, one side or the level above or the level below, if you have a particular supervisor, you things that you have to worry about for, for this is what he's showing you, the approach and also the, the lack of a posterior wall. But once you get into that tumor, it's going to spill over into the posterior wall, through the posterior wall into the canal, so you have to be ready for that. And the uh, ablation, if you do any uh, augmentation on neoplastic lesions, ablate first. There's some data by Cruz and Kieran Murphy have other papers that measure in animals that you do the lymph hypoplastic, you will get neoplastic cells in the circulation after doing that. So for neoplastic lesions, all of these I will ablate first, unless it's in myeloma. Tons of breast mass scattered throughout, and you try to prevent spreading the tumor, that's what ablation is for. And I'm going to. Um go back to that deformity case. This is what she looks like pain-free in the office. And remember, you're going to be in the fluoro pain suite with just x-ray. You're not going to get this kind of detail. You're going to get this kind of detail. And so it's critically important that you find in this osteoporotic patient orthogonal x-rays because frankly, you can see a pedicle up here, good luck in here, because these are out of plane. You can see a pedicle here, it's all guesswork in here. So when you are setting up 
to do this type of work, remember to get the orthogonal AP lat, rotate the table, the, the patient comes to the floor. The C-arm is on the floor and it's perpendicular for uh, the orthogonal AP and lateral. You bring the patient's deformity into the plane of x-ray, not vice versa. You focus it so you're orthogonal at the level of injury. And if you have to count your way up because you can't see the pelvis, then walk your way up, dock on number two, and then use that as your new platform for counting up to the uh, thoracolumbar lumbar junction, which is where this one is. And you can safely and accurately perform single level. And at the end of each single level, you have to go back through the orthogonal reorientation and changing the angle of the bed and the, the Trendelenburg of the bed until you get it precisely. Once you have the, if it's a multiple level fracture, once you have the first kyphoplasty properly counted, it's now your count level. And you can go above and below it safely, having counted your way up there initially. But you can easily get lost here. And so a mindful to count your way up and get orthogonal x-rays before you start. Doug. The critically important thing about this is these deforming forces put the center of gravity well outside the collapsed vertebral body. So if you don't strengthen it in some fashion, that patient is going to cascade into her, her chest is going to cascade into her pelvis. And each breath that she takes, the ribs snap over the ilium. And so you can't sleep, breathe, cough, walk without pain from your ribs impinging on your ilium. So stabilizing this, reducing this, and giving strength back to the spine is hugely impactful. And you have the capacity to do it. You just have to do it safely. <laughs>